Today I wanted to finish my uh, little mini-series on the film director Max Ophuls. This is the third and final film I'll be talking about. And this is his final film, Lola Montez, released in 1955. Uh, and um, on one of the supplements, uh, uh, I think it's in the commentary, there's an anecdote about Stanley Kubrick who was filming Pass of Glory when Max Ophuls, the announcement of Max Ophuls' death was um, uh, given. and uh, he was on set and he uh, stopped production and told the crew that today's uh, shooting will be dedicated to the memory of Max Ophuls. Now, I, in my previous video uh, on uh, the earrings of Madame Du, I connected Kubrick to, uh, to Ophuls in a couple different uh, uh, aspects. In thinking about Lola Montez, I was reminded of Barry Lyndon, which was Kubrick's uh, historical costumer. Uh, and and one that's that uh, whose leading role was played by Ryan O'Neill, who was a very popular uh, film star at the time, uh, but rather lightweight. I think it's fair to say uh, a pretty boy. Um, I don't think he's all that bad in the film, but um, certainly you can. It's the type of film where you're watching and think, Gee, what would this film be like if there was a, a, a more um, uh, a more efficient actor in the role. Um, and I don't know what the production history of uh, Barry Lyndon, whether how whether Brian O'Neill was his, uh, Kubrick's first choice or not. But in Lola Montez, um, uh, Max Ophuls was forced to cast Martin Carroll in the part by the producers. The the movie had become, a, which Ophuls originally envisioned as a, a black and white film. Now they wanted cinemascope, they wanted color, they wanted stereophonic sound. It was becoming more and more uh, expensive. And uh, although Martine Carroll is otherwise forgotten today, she was a big star in 1955. In French movies, she was making very risque type films, costumers, uh, in which she was, uh, you know, bodice ripping and bathtub scenes and uh, uh, these films, I think, even in France, presumably, are, are forgotten today, but in 1955, she was considered box office. But she was not a good actress, and she herself uh, expressed that this is, not, I told Ophuls, this isn't a part for me, I can't play this part. Uh, but Ophuls really uh, uh, worked with her, and her, her, sort of, uh, her sort of blank expression, he really, he really uses it well in Lula Montez. You might not you might not think so the first time you see the film. You say, who is this actress? Um, and, and there's something almost poignant about the whole aspect of Martine Corot playing this role because she, she really is the, the face of Lola Montez. I mean, this is what she's remembered for. She is, she becomes Lola Montez, whatever her deficiencies as an actress. I think uh, in, uh, in Barry Lyndon, uh, Kubrick took... Uh, 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 sort of compensated somewhat with his, uh, for uh, Brian O'Neill with uh, uh, drawing our attention to very studied, beautiful tableau based on, um, based on uh, paintings of the era. And with Ophuls, he, he designs uh, a circus metaphor. He loves circuses, and he uses a real-life circus in this film. And it's a flashback movie, so we keep coming back to the circus. And it's an unrealistic uh, circus. It's abstract to the max. Uh, it's a circus totally devoted to the life of Lola Montez, who was a famous, he was a real life celebrity. Uh, this, this movie is very much a commentary on celebrity and the worshiping of celebrities. Um, so we see various aspects of her life uh, and uh, w that are performed within the circus, but we see the actual events as they occur in in Lola Montez's uh, uh, in Lola Montez's uh, uh, memories. Um, so the first one uh, we go we we see an affair uh, filmed in a coach, and somehow uh, uh, Max Ophuls manages to do a tracking shot within that coach uh, with Franz Liszt. Now, it, 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 Lola Montez was a real life figure, but she was, um, and she knew Franz Liszt. It's, it's not that biographers don't really have any real knowledge or uh, real evidence that she actually had a, 
an affair with France Liszt, but it's a beautiful segment. Then we see, we, we go back to the circus and then we go back to um, her, uh, her, yeah, uh, her teenage years where she marries the lover of her mother. Her mother's trying to marry her off to a very rich baron. Um, and uh, instead, Lola Matez marries her mother's lover. But he turns out to be a drunken no-gooder. No and um, and uh, so Lola Montez has to, uh, and her name wasn't Lola Montez in real life. Uh, that becomes her name when she becomes a celebrity. Uh, there, uh, there, then there's a very long, very effective, certainly the best part of the movie, I think, for most people is, the, is her affair with King Ludwig of Bavaria. Now, this is not the mad King Ludwig. Uh, but uh, they ha she, he becomes uh, uh, totally uh, uh, bewitched by her. But it, their affair is seen as if not true love because there was a great age difference. True affection between a very deep affection that, that Ophels really brings out in this movie. And yeah, he, she makes him the, she, uh, he makes her, his official mistress, gives her a castle. Uh, but in 1848, when revolutions were going all through uh, Europe, uh, there was a revolution that Lola Montes had to go. <laughs> and, and she's saved by a student uh, played by uh, Oscar Werner. And uh, very early Oscar Werner, 1955 role. Uh, and uh, he's a, he's he, he could be the twin of David Hemmings. I, I was just so struck by how <laughs> the David Hemmings say a blow up looks just like him. And that's historically accurate. There was actually a group of students that formed uh, a society uh, that kind of uh, worshipped Lola Montez, and they do save her from the, the revolution. And this was, in, in Bavaria, this was a revolution of the right wing of the church and conservative uh, forces that, uh, that felt that Lola Montez was, had been given way too much uh, uh, influence over the king. Um, so that we and, and then we return to the circus and uh, the ringmaster is played by Peter Ustinov and maybe his greatest role of all time, uh, and uh, and and he also is presumed to be a former lover or at least he still loves her. But um, as they as they go through her whole life, um, and uh, in the commentary by uh, Susan White. Uh, which is outstanding, and I and she wrote a book about Max Ophuls, which I have right here. And this is a the cinema of Max Ophuls. This is a very scholarly work, uh, pretty dense. I have to go through it slow, but her commentary is a lot more down to earth. Uh, but she does cover many of the themes in 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 uh, in Lola Montez, which is also themes in in all of Max Ophuls movies. Very much gender, very much. Uh, like uh, Mitsuguchi, I think she she cites as a, as a director that very much concerned with women's con, women's uh, the role and their, their kind of imprisonment by the patriarchy in this era. Um, certainly class as well, um, and and mostly you know the male gaze and uh, back. So, I mean, this is the film that illustrates <laughs> the male gaze, and you'll see it illustrated spectacularly in the final shot of. Of Lola Montez, and um, uh, so on its original release in 1955, it was an absolute commercial and critical debacle. And Marcel Ophuls, the son of Max Ophuls, who was in a, served as an assistant on Lola Montez, they stand across the street from the premiere, uh, the opening night in Paris, and uh, they watch uh, uh, people coming out from the early show and uh, coming out early from the show, from the movie, and telling the people in line, don't bother, it's horrible. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's not worth your time or your money. One can only imagine uh, Max Ophuls, the effort, uh, the imagination that Ophuls put into Lola Montez, how devastating that must have been to him. And then it was butchered by the producers. Uh, it was scenes where the whole scenes taken out. When it played in the U.S., it, it, uh, it played in uh, it, it, the flashback uh, uh, structure was taken away and it played in a linear uh, form, uh, and which is a real desecration because if, if nothing else, Lil, Lil Mata is like all Max Ophel's films 
were, um, were absolutely beautifully constructed. Um, and uh, oh, there's also an essay uh, in, in Lola Montes in this little booklet by Gary Giddens. And Giddens was uh, mostly a music critic. He wrote great uh, film criticism as well. Uh, but he's perfect for this because his musical, his background in music really uh, gives him a unique perspective on, on this construction by Max Ophuls because Lola Montes is, is, like some of his films, but particularly Lola Montes is constructed like a symphony. It, and he breaks, Gary Giddens breaks the film down into the various movements of this symphonic structure that, that uh, Max Ophuls gives to uh, Lola Montes. So then, uh, in 1968, a, a, another producer uh, bought the rights to Lola Montes and then uh, reconstructed it, uh, uh, hopefully into a form that was close to what the original Max Ophel's cut was. It still was missing a few things that, that, uh, come, that, that have been restored into the Criterion release, Blu-ray release of the film. Um, but... Uh, and when it was released in the U.S., um, uh, and, and the film, uh, even in the beginning, the film was, and Max Ophuls and Lola Montes were, were greatly championed by the Carrière de Cinema uh, critics, and most particularly Francois Truffaut, who um, had, had a correspondence with Ophuls. And, uh, and in one of the supplements, Marcel Ophuls reads a letter from, uh, that Ophuls wrote to Truffaut and thanking him for his support. Uh, when it came to the U.S. in 1968, Andrew Saris, who was the uh, the auteur, the popularizer of the auteur theory in the United States and, uh, and uh, quite a, uh, um, a prominent critic of 1968, and I was, in, in, my, in those years, I was a, very much a disciple of Andrew Saris, and he, in his review, he called Lola Montes the, the, the greatest film ever made, and he would... He would um, uh, stake his critical reputation on that. Well, that's uh, kind of the kiss of death for a film like Citizen Kane. One of the most common reactions, you know, what well, Citizen Kane is the greatest film ever made, and people see it, and whoa, it's so great about that. And Little Montes is probably even more open to that because uh, of uh, the the performance by Martin Carroll and and uh, the circus. You, the circus itself is so abstract and so baroque that. Um, it's kind of difficult to get your bearings within it. Uh, so I went to see it, and I was perplexed for those reasons. And uh, but uh, uh, through the years, uh, uh, I, I've come to appreciate it a lot more, especially in this recent. I will watch, rewatch, and then rewatching it with the commentary. Um, I'm much more uh, inclined to view it as the masterpiece that both Susan White and uh, Gary Giddens and Andrew Saris uh, thought it was. Um, if nothing else, he gave it. He gave it people. He wanted to get people to notice it, to, to, to at least contemplate: is this a great film or not? Even if the consensus was not that it was not. And for me, uh, Max Ophuls in general, Ola Montes in particular, are uh, are. Uh, Things that I like to come back to, I, I feel a compulsion to come back to, uh, in, in, and I have that like in novels, maybe *The Sheltering Sky* by Paul Bowles or uh, um, uh, *The Great Gatsby* by F. Scott Fitzgerald. They, they just books. That every once in a while, I just feel a need. I need to read that. And in music, it would be Bob Dylan for sure. I grew up. I was a teenager in the '60s when Dylan started, and although I don't listen to him much anymore. Sometimes I just have to. It's the plaintive quality, the the uh, the poignancy and uh, the, of, of his lyrics, and whether it be blowing in the wind from from uh, you know the distant past or more likely now, uh, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. Would be the song I, I sometimes have to listen to over and over again, uh, and in the same way with Ophelson, it's it's kind of a style, a, a directing style that. Um, is, 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 is so unique, and, uh, and uh, Alfred Hitchcock is another one who, who he didn't make realistic films. There, these, this, he has the same abstract quality to his films, but he had this individualistic idea of what cinema could be. And Ophuls had the same way with these um, 
fantastic uh, tracking shots. They're not just technical uh, bravura. They're, they're expressive of something very mysterious in life. Um, the movement of characters through, through space, through time. I, I just have to come back to some, sometimes I get chills watching some of the, 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 the tracking shots and Ola Montez begins and ends with spectacular tracking shots and there's a, there's a couple in between too that go on for minutes and minutes and just I, I just find the man absolutely entrancing. So uh, this will be completing my uh, little mini series on, uh, on Max Ophel, who's a direct, one of my all-time favorite directors, artists of any kind. It's not the place to start. I would more or less recommend uh, um, uh, the Earrings of Madame Du and perhaps a couple of the Letter from a Unknown Woman are caught to, to his two best American films. Um, but uh, that'll about wrap this one up. Thanks as always for everybody who managed to listen to me this far. I do appreciate it. Hopefully I said something interesting along the way. You guys take care.